Well, good evening, everyone, on this wonderful summer day. I don't know how hot it got, but it got hot. 92 in Burlington. Was it really? Wow. Yep, tied, tied the record. But wow. We, we had 88 here, and Wayne's brother lives in Woodstock, Georgia. They had 75. Wow. Go <laughs> <Both> figure. <laughs> I think it's backwards. Yeah, absolutely. Upside down, sideways. All right, so let's get started. I'll call the meeting to order at 7... Oh, three, according to my computer. Um, public comment for items not on the agenda. And additions or changes to the agenda. All right. Hearing none, thank you, Bill and Kathleen, for joining us. Um, Kathleen and Bill wanted to give us an update on their hazardous waste facility project and reopening um, as um, under, in the pandemic here. So take it away. Well, thank you very much for uh, hosting us this evening. Um, I'd like to just give you some updates and Bill, please join in at any point uh, if anything you'd like to add. So uh, as you all may know, CBS at UMD, Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, has had a goal for some time to uh, have a household hazardous waste facility. And uh, it's our number one requested item that you hear from the public for a year round facility that um, would bring some services for people who have hazardous waste at any time of the year. This meeting is being recorded. All right. <laughs> okay, I don't know who that is, but. So we know that there are many benefits for having this, this facility. Um, and the state of Vermont, with the universal recycling law and the state plan, have recognized that central Vermont is one of the parts of the state that uh, really needs this facility. So we received a $500,000 grant earlier this year from the state of Vermont and our board of supervisors has committed $594,000 in reserve funds for this project. We expect it would be about $1.2 to get the facility uh, operational built. And we expect it will be ready and have um, be open for business by spring 2022. We do have a gap uh, unsecured funds, and we are in the process of doing fundraising to um, obtain those funds. We're looking at Barry, Montpelier, East Montpelier, Berlin area for the location of the facility, and. Um, Right now, we've, uh, we're still in the planning phase, but we do have a committee. We have uh, a committee specifically charged with uh, helping this move forward within our board structure. And um, we would probably not hold the events. Right now, we have five seasonal events. And, once we have the permanent facility, we, for instance, may not hold an event in Barry Town or East Town Pillar because people can easily get a facility itself. Uh, so I wanted to let you know about that possibility that we wouldn't have as many local events, but um, we have a, a better facility for convenience here now. Bill, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, I thought that was thorough. The thing I would describe is for the select board's you know, benefit is some order of magnitude of what household hazard waste costs your district. Um, three years ago, 41,000 pounds. Last year, 57. This year, 84. So it's doubled in three years. And with COVID and people, uh, you know, you know, unable to unload things, what we are imagining is going to be a, a fairly significant pulse. It, it's just, we, we need to continue to support the 
charge of this, uh, of this event until this facility is built. And the, the need is there. As Kathleen said, number one on uh, surveys of our member town residents and what they want. So, thank you. Uh, and wanted to uh, give you some good news. Because of COVID-19, um, we basically had to put all our seasonal events on hold. And uh, we now have gotten to go ahead with our call-in contractor to move forward. So, in fact, we will be having the five events. The only one that had to change the date is Barry Town. So that's going to be on August 1st, but we uh, begin first in Tunbridge on June 6th. Um, then we go to Hardwick on the 11th of July, Bradford on August 15th, and uh, we wrap up in Montpelier in late September. Unless something goes awry, that's our expected schedule um, in terms of COVID-19. It's possible that there would have to be some new restrictions, but we are not anticipating that right now. So that's one excellent piece of news uh, that we've been able to continue with those because they are really critical to having the outlets for folks with their hazardous waste. So Kathleen, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Yeah, I was reading something on the league website or somewhere that um, because of C-19, some of the recycling laws that are supposed to go into effect have been changed or amended. Is, do you know what that, can you, do you have any knowledge? Um, well, right now there, there have been two fairly active committees in, in the legislature, the House uh, Natural Resources Committee and the Senate Natural Resources Committee, especially the Senate. Uh, has had uh, a number of days of testimony and some proponents of holding all the elements of Act 148 in place and then some uh, people testifying to ask for some changes. And as far as um, right now, the, those particular suggestions are not moving forward. We fully expect that the food scrap landfill ban will go into effect as of July 1st. Uh, and all the other provisions of, of Act 148 will remain in effect. However, there is some continued discussion uh, at Senate Natural Resources, and it's expected that that will be discussed again um, in the full Senate that would allow uh, variances to be provided by the Agency of Natural Resources specifically for COVID-related circumstances, whether it's a hauler or a facility, if there's some specific reason that um, one of those organizations or entities cannot uh, handle certain materials or keep their facility open because of COVID-19, there could be some uh, some variance for a certain small length of time. Now that is what we expect might be brought forward by the Senate Natural Resources era. There's been no discussion of that in the House. So whether this will proceed, uh, get attached to another bill and make it through both chambers is unknown, but you're right, Denise, there have been a lot of discussions about making changes to Act 148, and it doesn't appear that those are going to happen. But well, I was wondering about the plastic bag ban. It's supposed to go in effect July 1. Um, as far as I know, that's, that's still moving forward, but um, different committees are starting to take testimony, I think the uh, Senate Finance, yeah. In terms of some of the uh, dollars implications in, in relation to COVID-19. So you're right, that, that's still being played out. Okay, thank you. 
Anybody else have any questions for Kathleen or Bill? Any comments that our ARC facility in Barry City reopened last week for certain materials, um, paint, batteries, bulbs, computers, and TV electronics, and bootstraps on a donation basis. We hope in late in summer to open up the ARC to the VAT, the, the much larger set of materials that we accept there, but for right now we're really focused on universal waste items that um, I just listed. Um, so we're glad that we're open and available to the public for that. We've also been having um, curbside sales of compost equipment, and, and those have been um, very well received. So people can do backyard composting. Uh, that um, is listed on our website, those dates, which is www.cvswmd.org. We have a couple more of those uh, yet to go, and we'll schedule additional ones this summer. But our office is closed, so the option of people coming in to pick up compost equipment is limited. Really, these curbside events are um, the way that we're people can reach out to people. And those are held at the very facility, not at the office. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Yeah. John Brabant, hi. Um, the Hardwick event, that, that'll be held where? Town Garage? The HHW? Yes. yes. Okay. And what, what time? That's in the morning? Nine to one. Nine to one. Okay. And will you take compact fluorescent bulbs there? No, I'm glad you asked that. We are not going to be taking any um, materials that normally we would accept on the side because of COVID-19. We're just going to do household hazardous goods. Does the ARC take uh, old compact fluorescents? Yes. Okay. That would be something that you could start bringing now. When we're, uh, yeah, and when, when we open up. 100%, of course, we can do the paper. But yeah, she can do the Great, thank you. May I follow up on John's inquiry? Um, any co op member can also drop her bulbs off at the co op office with advance notice because we are not open to the public, but we will accept those. Uh, You're talking about the Washington Electric Co op, right? Right. Thanks, Bill. So, I'll just drop off at your house. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking about your house, Bill. I heard what John's doing. Okay. So thank you guys for entertaining um, this update, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Okay, anything else, Kathleen? I uh, know that, that covers it. I look forward to meeting with you again in person uh, at some point, but it's great to be able to discuss with you tonight. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, be in touch. Once we a little better idea of, uh, of details on the HHW facility. We'd like to talk with you again. Okay, you said you're looking at Montpelier, Barry, Berlin, He's right? Right. All righty. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Take care. Do you see um, where Toby or Alfred are trying to come on? No, they have not uh, nope. logged in. Okay, I just tried following Alfred's various numbers and all they get is voicemail. Um, they all re they received the agenda. When we talked to Alfred last, we let him know that tonight would be the night for him to present his review of the budget and bring us some ideas. Um, so, here we are. So, uh, uh, Alfred's not here, but it's a road issue. Talking about Alfred and the roads. Um, as you know, the roads have been getting pretty darn dusty. Yeah. And uh, I texted Alfred over the weekend, um, and then again this morning, asking him about 
you know, what's, uh, is a crew in fact out with chloride uh, spraying to <clears throat> keep the dust down. And he said that they had run out. Um, I don't have my iPhone with me, but it was something like he, they ran out and they just got it and they're going to, they're going to begin applying. I assume they are, or will be tomorrow. Okay. And that's good to know because I had a call over the weekend about the dust as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think the normal practice is that the chloride spray truck follows one of the graders. Didn't happen this year. Yeah. So when do they think they're going to have it supply back done? Uh, let me get my iPhone. I'll let you know. Because that's going to be something I'm sure other people are going to call about if this doesn't get fixed pretty quick. Denise, what's our, what's our, we, we haven't talked about this actively, but what's our tolerance for, um, we asked Toby and Alfred to be here. They're on the, they're on the agenda between the 7 and 7.30 window. Sometimes we have folks come in well after their scheduled time, and perhaps we've been, perhaps we've been too tolerant of that. Very lenient, I would say. So I'm just putting out there that this might be. We should maybe talk about this at the end of the meeting and executive session because I'm not particularly happy about this. Right. I'm just going to finish my sentence that we reap what we sow. Waiting for John. Oh, I see chance. I see a, a ceiling. He was there a second ago. Oh, there we were having some problems with audio, but I think they're fine now. Um, I don't know where John went to get his phone, but. I hate to get Jan started and then John comes back with more info. Anybody got a good joke? No? Good joke. Hmm. What dog fails time? I don't know. Watch dog. <laughs> cute, very cute. That, I learned that in kindergarten. And you still remember it, so it hasn't, Alzheimer's hasn't set in too bad yet. says, we were out of chloride for a bit, but we just got a load today. So that was the answer. So I assume we're going to see chloride on the road shortly. All righty. Could you text Alfred and let him know he's late attending our meeting that we asked him to be ready for? Mm -hmm. Jan, do you want to talk about um, the listers and the grand list and what's going on. Give us an update. I'm not sure what you want to know. Um, well, you want us to sign this extension request. Can you tell us we what have led up to that? Well, in part because of COVID-19 and the closure of the office. The listers could not do their routine work for about four weeks. And then we were able to negotiate a time where the listers could work only on Fridays. We um, still have, to, as of tomorrow, probably two outstanding inspections. We have had seven new houses to go see, and we cannot do interior inspections. So therefore, we've had to ask um, the property owners to provide us documentation via email. Uh, so far, uh, I would say all but two, well, one, we have one outstanding yet. Um, the idea is on this, is we are supposed to generate an abstract on June 4th, meaning um, we generate this, this, we lodge the first grand list printing on June 4th, at which point we tell people that from 14 days from that point, we will have grievances. We are going to be about probably two weeks delayed, um, which means the grievances will be two weeks after that. And once we resolve the grievances at that point, we can generate a final grand list 
which would be used for taxes. So you're going to be two weeks behind. <coughs> According to the state, um, we need to ask for this um, extension from the June 4th date. Yeah, so how do you get interior stuff? What do you have them send you pictures or something? No, we have a checklist of a couple things that we send out, um, which is our inspection list. And we've asked the builders, of the businesses, well, we've asked the property owners, and they have in turn asked their builders to complete that. And that includes things like square footage, uh, what kind of heat, what kind of, you know, we can go out and do the external things as to, as to roof, but how many bathrooms do they have? How many, whatever else, interior, what their heating source is, we're relying on them to give it back. And what we're doing is basically saying that in 2021, we will re-inspect. Alrighty, any questions for the listers? Sam? Yeah? Um, did, are you able to, I know that uh, Friday there's uh, an issue with using the town office, but your schedule's okay after that? You're getting the time you need? Yeah, right. Um, Judy's been very accommodating, um, and we know that you're doing the <coughs> over on Friday, so we're not going to be in. Uh, the, our days, tomorrow is inspection. I have Thursday, I have other things, and we know Friday is this, so we can't do anything until next week um, to complete anything else because, you know, of everything that's going on this week. Yeah. I know Judy's been trying to make accommodations so you can get in so that's that's good the, the other thing to let you know is um we are thinking of we have not totally determined how we're going to state this in our change of appraisal notices we are going to offer the property owners one day to do a phone type of grievance um, and whether or not we use zoom i don't know we could just do a conference call we haven't decided that or um, they can come in on another day in mask and go to the town hall. So we are thinking, because of the fact that this is one at a time and we can stage it um, like once every 30 minutes or something like that. Um, so we're going to give the property owners kind of the choice. We yeah. just don't know how that's going to work. But I do suspect... <laughs> We know we're going to have three or four grievances for sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're just, you know, we're, we're debating about how to word that. And we've got to put that notice in with the change of appraisal notice. And we need it to have it well documented so that they know what the property owners know what to do. So you said, I mean, I think Zoom is a good option. It well. is. But we would have to work this through Cliff and how we would do that. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've talked about it. I've talked about it with Cliff in that we would have maybe one day uh, and we don't know what the people want. In other words, we're sending out probably 60 or 70 change of appraisal notices. Uh, yeah. So, you know, of that, we don't know who's going to call in for a grievance until they call in and set up an appointment. And so whether we give them a chance to say, hey, you can do this on the phone, at which point I can ask Cliff, can we have some Zoom time, or do we just simply do a conference call and simply use the town hall as opposed to the town office? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Cliff can set it up as you've done with planning to, you. he sets it up and you drive. Yeah, we can do that. Um, so a question about the the extension this is to file the grand list with yes. the tax department yes okay so that means that because we can't set our tax rate until we have i'm just trying to think this through so bear with me we can't set our tax rate until we have that confirmed by the tax department right That's correct okay because we're looking at um, our budgets and trying Actually, to... It's not, Denise, it's not only your budget, it's when you release your tax bill. Right, yeah, I know you didn't let me finish. Um, we're looking at the some savings, which would 
reduce the tax rate, but that's, and then, then we have to have how much, what the value of everything, of the grand list. I'm just trying to think it through. So we probably won't be able to set the tax rate then until July. Most, uh, well, I would say mid-July. Yeah, okay. All right. That's good to know. If all things go well, I'm not promising mid-July. <laughs> yeah. No, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I appreciate all the work the listeners are doing to try to coordinate this. I know it's not that easy. Um, okay. Any other questions before I ask about this letter? So this is just, we just sign off on this to say that we approve of the late, um, the extension. That's all it is. And it's in the, it's in the folder so everybody's had an opportunity to look at it. I should just state that, the, you know, that's a very broad letter from PVR. It just, it, it extends an extension that it can go all the way to September 15th. There is no intention that the callous listers will go to that far. Yeah. We need an extension to cover us, to give us cushion time, because we can't meet the June 4th um, initial abstract, nor can we meet the July early July final grand list. And I think it, we think we're going to be two weeks out at best. Yeah. Well, that's pretty darn good, though. It'll only be two weeks out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah, because this says an extension of all towns to August 15th is hereby granted and applies to blah, 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 the requirements of for transmission to the Department of PVR and also extend to September 15th. So, all right. Um, anybody have any more questions for the listers? No. Nope. All right. Would somebody like to make a motion? Authorizing me to sign this um, letter and return it to, who am I sending this back to? Jill Remick, I guess. Yeah, Jill Remick at PBR. Okay. Anybody want to make that motion? So no. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, Cliff? Aye. Um, who's next? Rose? Aye. John? Aye. Darren? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, I'll get this off to um, Jill tomorrow. Jan. Thank you, guys. Thank I you. All right. Thanks, Jan. I will leave. Thank you. 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 His work cell, his shop number, and his personal cell. Yep, I um, did all the same. And no answer. Left voicemails. Sent them a text. Okay. All right. Um, I know that Chance is waiting to talk to us. Where did he go? Oh, there he is. So would you guys all be okay to move Chance up? and do CV fiber after Chance? Sure. Hey, Chance, you there? Got a tap? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I was trying to keep myself muted. We're actually, uh, about three quarters of our department is out at a car accident right now, so there's a lot of radio yeah. traffic. I was keeping myself muted. Where's the accident? Uh, up on the county road. Oh, dear. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. What town? Uh, it's, this one. This one's in Woodbury. We're not in your town, John. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so it's on the wood on the dirt road part of County. Yep. Yep. Oh wow. All right. So, um, you sent us the contract for services for twenty 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 one, and this is to this is for pro providing the fire. Um, fire protection. Yep. And you had sent us a cover email um, that everybody had a chance to look at, hopefully. Um, you want to just 
give us a rundown? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's it's mostly the same that we do every year. We break it into the quarterly prices for the operating costs, and the truck replacement fund gets paid July first. The one uh, the one change was last year we had done the the capital replacement plan July first, and then there was some discussion about you know the financial uh, hardship that it placed on your town, and the differences between Woodbury and Callis was basically. Um, Woodbury authorizes their select board to borrow the money whenever they have to pay stuff like this up front before tax collection. So, so you guys don't do that. Um, right. I, I, I went back to the membership and said, you know, it would be better if we waited until after they got their first tax collection before we bill that so that you guys could actually be uh, on the right side of the ball versus the back side of the ball. Um, so yeah, we try not to borrow and pay interest if we don't have to. Right. Well, and, and Woodbury does that. They authorize them right at town meeting to be able to do that with everything that they have because we don't collect until until August, so they wouldn't be able to pay any of their bills starting July first. Right. Yeah. So you're asked. So this contract includes um, payment of this the, for the volunteer fire department services. Yep. And it includes the truck we. Replacement fund of thirty-one thousand. Uh, the truck replacement is seventeen eight fifty. Oh, seventy. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. And the thirty-one for the capital replacement fund. Correct. Um, eight thousand four hundred seventy dollars on the first day of each calendar quarter for the operating expenses, and the truck fund shall be due in the in full on the first day of the contract year. So is that July first. That is, that is July 1st, yep. Okay, I'm just trying to understand, so how much? So the $17,850 is paid on July 1st, just like it always has been. Yeah. And then the $8,477 would be due on July 1st. And that would be it due July 1st. <clears throat> and that's the um, capital replacement fund? No, that's the truck fund. And the operating expenses. The whole pool. I'm just trying. The capital replacement fund shall be due in full no later than October one. So the capital replacement fund is the thirty-one thousand. Correct. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. So and that's and that's what would be due October first would be the thirty-one thousand for the capital replacement, and then the second quarter uh, operating expenses of eight thousand four hundred seventy-seven dollars would be due also October first. And then January 1st, it would just be the 8477 and same with April 1st. Yeah. Okay, any, any comments or questions from the board? Um, this is here for us to see a first draft tonight. Um, no, I think they're asking. We received this in, in the email asking us to sign this. We can help. When does this have to be signed by Chan? Well, we need we need to uh, have it signed and executed by June 30th at the latest. Okay. Uh, I, I sent it to you guys as a draft uh, only because I wanted you guys to be able to read it and, and have some time because I in previous years it hasn't really been given to you guys in a time. Mm -hmm. So I want to keep moving forward with these, you know, uh, gestures of kindness from us trying to you know be better prepared for you guys. Yeah, we now, was yeah, I know, I know you do, and I and I appreciate your patience. <laughs> um, but if you guys uh, are in agreement with this, then I will get the final copy, you know, with signature lines, get it to you, so it's dated for whatever select board meeting you'd vote on it, and I can date it and again send it to you guys that way, and you guys can deal with. It. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're ready to sign it tonight. Cool. And that's exactly why I sent it the way I did, so you guys yeah. can talk about it. I think Sharon, Sharon, are you waving your hand? I can't really see. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chance, what are what are you guys thinking about in terms of how you are adapting to anticipate reduced budgets, tighter wallets, lower possible select board possibly having to lower budgets. Have you guys talked about that, about what, what, if anything, that has to do with the fire department? 
Well, I think the issue comes back to is that, you know, especially uh, I, I can't speak for Callis, I'm not a member of Callis, but Woodbury approved the budgets already. And that's right. what they, uh, they've stated to pay. And unfortunately for us, we, we are not a, a profit corporation. So our budget is based on the bills we have to pay. Um, so there's really not, it's not like we can cut out the fluff fund in our budget. Uh, our budget is what our budget is. Yeah, I, don't think, yeah, I, don't, I don't think any of us have any fluff, but S-344, which was passed by the legislature, um, authorizes select boards to look at their budgets and see where they might garner some savings to help the taxpayers who are going to be hurting. You know, it's going to be hard for people, really hard. It's, you know, it was already hard. Now you put COVID on top of it, and people are really struggling. Oh, I know. Well, and, and not just hard for the taxpayers. I mean, what we're anticipating is that we're going to see reduced, um, or we're going to see increased delinquencies, and we're going to have to um, anticipate. We will be smart to anticipate that. Well, and I, and I think that's the, the, you know, obviously there has to be some anticipation of that, but at the same time, we're not going to know exactly what it's going to look like until the numbers start to roll. And... I, I don't know how to not pay my electric bill here. I don't know how not to put fuel in the fire trucks to get to the calls. Um, I'm assuming if at some point in time, the feds and the state and then eventually the towns uh, decide what is and isn't going to be happening with budgets, then everybody down the line is going to have to you know figure it out. But at this point, I, I'm not, uh, I am not uh, able to decide which bills I'm not going to pay at this point. I have to wait and see what's what's happening with everybody else. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, it's not it's not easy for any of us. We might, we're all going to have to make some tough choices and not, you know, kind of hold our nose and, and make some decisions. We're not going to have a choice. Well, and that's exactly it. When we get to that point, you know, when I say we, I mean the fire department. When the fire department gets to that point where we're being told, you know, by the state or by the feds or by the town, you know, this is what's happening, then we'll have to figure it out. Uh, and if that means not providing services and closing the doors, then that's what it'll be. Um, I mean, I think... Um, I, I don't think it's at that point, don't get me wrong, but, yeah. you know. Well, you know, we have to make some decisions, obviously, before the tax bills even go out, as you heard in our previous discussion with the Lister. Um, so, you know, like I said, this is not, you know, this is... The, the cliche now, we're all in this together, is very true. Yes. No. I'd like to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Rose. I think when we talk about the budget, and we think about looking at areas that we can cut. I think um, fire protection is not one of the places that I would choose to cut. Um, you know, I would cut sand and gravel and you know, painting the town hall and doing things like that. But when it comes to um, protecting the public, um, because if our house burns, we can't say, you know, sorry, we only have one truck and it's out of fuel, or it needed a major repair and nobody could respond. Um, so I would be in favor of um, agreeing to the um, amounts outlined in this contract tonight no cuts for emergency services. Um, and that's how I feel. Yeah, very well said. I'm not, I don't think we're talking about cuts to emergency services. We have um, a capital replacement fund. Mm -hmm. That's for, you know, putting money aside to buy future equipment. Right. So that right. doesn't involve the services. Right. Well, it, 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 pay, it does pay for one of the fire trucks sitting in the apparatus, and it's also supposed to be uh, purchasing the replacement air packs. That was was all discussed with the capital replacement plan. If you look back, you'll see that's exactly what that money was designed for, and that's where the was approved it. Well, this says seventeen eight fifty for the truck replacement fund. Truck replacement fund was for the two original trucks that you guys had purchased through loans, or the fire department purchased through loans, and the towns approved previous years. Yeah, right. Now, replacement fund was to buy the new truck that got bought and to buy things like the new air packs that need to be bought so that we can continue to go to fires and respond in, inside a fire. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. 
So cutting the capital replacement fund is cutting fire services. Okay, so I don't think we're talking about cutting the fund necessarily. We just wanted to put it on the radar that. Right, no. Everything, everything's on the radar right now, everything. I know. I'm a taxpayer too. I get it. Yeah, yeah, okay. I know you do. Chance, can, Chance, can you send us an email with that in writing of of the okay. of the reserve? What we are calling the reserve fund. How much of it is is? Uh, no, the replaced capital replacement fund. I think is what you're talking about, Sharon. Right? Okay. Um, how much of it? Can, and and in a, in a note so that we have it, because my brain is not going to hang on to it, even though I know you have it in your brain, and I, I. I admire that. Um, how much of it is paying for things you already have and have, have a bill to pay? And how much of it is, I'm going to use the word reserve, is, is held in reserve so that there's a fund when there's a new need? That would be really helpful from my perspective. Well, I, I can tell you, I'll, I'll send you an email with all the material I gave you guys before, but right now I can tell you that $31,000 of the capital replacement plan, which is half of it, is paying for engine one. And the other money is going so that we can get the $120,000 saved up so that we can actually replace the SCBA. Is that, we, is that in the email you sent us for tonight? In which no, it's not. Okay. No, this was in all, in, all in regards to the capital replacement plan, all the stuff that we discussed like a year and a half, two years ago, maybe. Okay, if you could send it again. Thank sure. You. sure. And, it'll be in, and it'll be in the minutes too, right, Katie? Yeah, right. Really helpful. Yeah, sure. And just pass it on to the to the crew that we really appreciate everything they do. We're very supportive. I actually did respond. Uh, I did uh, talk to people. We had three grass fires the other day: one down in East Montpelier and two over in Cabot. And I let people know that you had responded to my original email, and uh, you had mentioned you know how much you guys appreciated what those responded. So that message has gone out. But yeah. I will continue to send it out because I think it's important that everybody hears. <laughs> you know, those yeah, I mean, you can't say it too many times, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. And everybody, everybody over your way is healthy. And we are, we are great over here. Uh, yeah. Woodbury and uh, Woodbury has had zero cases. Uh, we've, uh, we've managed to avoid everything, you know, from the entire town. Um, yeah. And just as a, as a little bit of a catch up too for you guys, uh, Paul and I are still uh, working on our medical license. Um, we are close actually to having the meeting with district four so that we can get our medical license taken care of. And once we have our medical license squared away, uh, I, I would probably not add it to the contract this year um, but next year, I'd like to add into the contract, um, you know, with your guys' say-so, that uh, we would also provide at no cost, you know, no additional cost, um, medical response as well. Because right now, you guys receive uh, EMTs and stuff like that from this month later, but we're almost finished with the cost. <coughs> well, for some of us, for some of us, you are closer. And, and that's exactly it. And that's why we're trying to push this so hard is because there is, you know, we have, we have uh, eight medical responders right now, six EMTs and two EMRs, and we have a ninth person who is testing out for their EMT. So we have a fairly large medical squad sitting on the side of the town line that just can't cross the line. Oh, good. That's great yeah. news. Are you going to be, are you going to be asking us to buy an ambulance? Uh, no, no. We, uh, I can tell you right now, the day this place has an ambulance is long after I'm out of here. Oh. Um, I have no desire to deal with an ambulance. We have an ambulance down in Hardwick. Uh, they provide an excellent service. They've got two ambulances, actually. And uh, I see the headaches. And I see the headaches reason up there. I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, so, so, so you would be able to come on scene to provide emergency medical assistance, but not transport. Correct. Correct. East Montpelier's ambulance or Hardwick's ambulance, whoever was closest, um, most of the time would be East Montpelier because they're contracted. Right. It would be the ambulance and the transport. But we would provide the uh, initial medical you know if we were first on scene we'd have nine people there to help so yeah yeah and then like i said that's not going to cost anything because we're already doing it okay um, and there's no ambulance to buy or anything like that so 
Uh, I'm hoping soon enough I'll be able to let you guys know we're doing that, and we may have to just put something in writing saying it's okay with you guys for us to come across your line and provide that service. Yeah. Okay. Cross all the people, dot all the eyes, you know. So. That's good news. Soon, yeah. Yep. All right. Anything else for chance? Anything else you want to update us on? I'm just wondering if chance and the Woodbury Fire Department has been successful at getting the Woodbury blackfly population to social distance. Well, you know, I don't know about social distancing, but they fed themselves really well on my two lower legs when I was working outside last weekend. So yeah. concern. Yeah. yeah. Concern. Nothing has changed here. Uh, we do blood donations to the black flies every single year. <laughs> You're a generous lot. I don't miss the Woodbury black flies. I <laughs> Most people don't miss them at all. <laughs> Thank you, Chance. Hey, not a problem, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a good guys. Thank you. Thanks, Chance. Thank Take you. Care. So, um, next up is CV Fiber. Remember, they had at their um, what was it? We we had David Healy on last meeting mm -hmm. um, about the CV Fiber letter. It's in the folder. Um, for you to review, I, I cleaned it up and I, um, they, they had something in there about property values. I took that out because we, I never got an answer as to whether that was, um, accurate. So, and then John had had some questions about the letter. Oh, they're, they're, they were in hopes of receiving that letter on by Friday, the 29th. So we told David that we would review it again tonight and try to get it back to him. Has everybody had a chance to look at it? Mm -hmm. John? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, Cliff's going to call it up. You should be able to see it now. Does that look okay to everybody? It's just it's just a letter of support. Right, yeah. It's not committing us to anything. Well and it and the, the important thing is that we put our position of support out there. So I'm good with it as it is. Rose, what do you think? I think it's fine. John? Yeah, my, my question, it wasn't a problem. My question was, you know, how they planned to see if there were plans to implement the rollout of high speed and would it be fiber to premises as was originally uh, indicated or some variation on that, of that. Because um, I've been hearing that they're the last mile they're looking at doing wireless or something. So, and that's what David Healy responded to. Right. Um, he uh, indicated, I think, their preference is to be uh, fiber to premises, but you know, there could be, they're evaluating um, wireless for the last mile or something. So, yeah. Um, and my, my concern was, um, and he, oh, so David Healy did say uh, we, to get the thing up and running, sooner rather than later, they'd get the fiber rolled out, and there is some fiber already out there as far as they can, and then try to fill the gaps uh, in, in the immediate, more immediate term with uh, wireless between the major fiber, uh, whatever, lines. Yeah. And uh, my question was, and it was a concern um, as well, fiber premises is far superior to wireless. We had a, a big backlash regarding wireless um, from the VTEL tower that was proposed. Yeah, I remember that. Wireless. And uh, we know a large segment of the people in town, uh, a significant segment of the people that live in town would, would rather have fiber to premises because of the concern of additional ra radiation being, you know, 
distributed around. So um, my concern was, and I asked David Healy, if you guys fill in the gaps using wireless, would that preclude all hybrid premises roll out, you know, from moving forward? And he said, that is not their plan. This is my recollection. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But he could see where that could be, you know, create a less and a stronger, it, the, the, the incentive would be diminished. Yeah. That's my understanding. Um, I, I, I think the letter is good, though. We want this letter to go out. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Cliff, did you have a chance to look at it? Yeah, no. I think it's, it's fine as is. Um, I agree with any of the edits, and uh, I think we should go ahead and move to get it out there. Okay. Is that a motion? Well, it's ho, 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 ho. Is there a way we could just underscore our interest, or this is my interest, to see fiber to premises as a first prior as a priority? Um, where would you put that in? As it just says high speed. I mean, there's 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 a major difference between high speed fiber and high speed wireless. There's, I don't know if it's an order of magnitude, but. So is that is that, a, is, that in the, is that in the is that in the paragraph that says the new norm? Is that what you is that what you're looking? At? Where is this, Denise? Point out. Like three quarters of the way down. The new norm is high speed internet at at every premises. Uh, I think it should say uh, we our understanding is that CB Fibers' intent is to deliver. Uh, high-speed fiber, high-speed internet via fiber optic cable. To every see, if everybody's in agreement with that, John, could you send me that language to insert and then um, I can't. we can get it out? If everyone's in agreement with that. But I, I, would, but I want the nuance if I say we understand in the near term that gaps may need to be bridged using wireless technology as an interim. I want to make it clear that what David Healy represented was in that letter. So this couldn't be, this does not say five for premises. It says internet to yeah. every household, basically, or every premise. That's different. Yeah. Are you, is everyone okay with that? Rose has got her finger up. It's a finger up. There's a typo. Okay, where? Paragraph two for the address, Vermont Agency of commerce wait a minute let me get let me get it out Cliff can you can you do anything I can't do anything with it from here let me see what I can do I think it's supposed to be agency of commerce and community development um but it says AMP semicolon Oh yeah, I wonder what. Oh, that's weird. You know what that is? Probably when it converted. Sometimes those weird things happen. I don't understand how that is. I see what you mean. It's up in the address. Yeah. Yeah, it should be Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development, not A not AMP. Hey, Cliff, can you put that back up, that sentence? I'm trying to type in a, a revised language to an email. For the new, thanks, the new. Got it, John? No, give me a second. You know what? I wonder if um, Toby may be at that car accident on County Road in Woodbury.
Denise, the uh, fire department was having their um, training or whatever via Zoom, and it was tonight at 7. So he's with EMFD, but he's probably, well, he wouldn't be at that car accident in Wood no, Aaron. I don't think so. Okay. No, he's at EMFD. He could let us know. Yeah. That can oh, yeah. Yeah. Can we circle back? Can we keep going and circle back? Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, don't wait for me. I'm typing. Keep going. Okay, because I'm waiting for, um, we're going to do the town hall update. So, um, Cliff, you want to talk about the call out system? Yeah, um, I definitely would like John to be uh, present and ears on for that discussion. So, uh, maybe what I can do is, the RFP. yeah, I'll talk about the RFP first. The RFP has gone out. Uh, so far, we are running it in the uh, Hardwick Gazette, the um, Times, Montpelier Times Argus, um, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, their classified section is running it as well. We proactively sent it to at least six different vendors and uh, hopefully we will get uh, some competitive responses. Um, given our, our situation with uh, the pandemic, we did let everyone know that um, it is subject to final and review and approval by the select board before we proceed with the project. And we will uh, be looking to have discussions about possibly completing it in phases as well. So not much else to report on that. We haven't received any responses yet. Um, I believe the, the deadline is June 19th for everyone to get a response to us by. Any questions on that? Hearing none. Okay. Um, John, did you finish composing your? I just sent it. I just emailed it to you all. Hey, okay, Cliff. Yeah. Cliff, um, David Sheets wants to be on by phone to talk about town hall. What number on this Zoom thing does he call? Um, he should be able to call almost any number there. They, um, some people have reported problems calling the New York number so he could try one of the other regions, but they're all toll free. Okay, David, are you ready? Okay, let's try Chicago. It's 1-312-626-6799. Yeah. The password is 591581. Yeah. Okay? All right. Okay, so you got that you got the language you want, John? Um, I typed up some language, I sent it to everyone, I, I forwarded it to Katie. Okay. Um, okay, it says, the new norm is fiber optic cable delivered high speed. The new norm is fiber optic cable delivered via. What? Delivered via. Yeah, Sorry. it's missing a word. Via high speed internet to every premise. Our understanding is that an interim measure, is that as an interim measure, that until fiber can be delivered to every premise, that some gaps may be temporarily bridged as an interim message using wireless technology, but that wireless will not permanently displace the full deployment of the fiber to premises for all users. So, via delivered via high speed, our understanding is that as an interim measure, our understanding is that as an interim measure, that until fiber can be delivered to every premise, some gaps 
may be temporarily bridged as an interim measure using wireless, but that wireless will not permanently displace the full deployment of fiber to premises for all users. Where are you putting VIA? There's no VIA. The new norm is fiber optic cable delivered high speed internet. I think it's low, but it needs a bunch of dashes. If you, if those are all adjectives, then yeah, you know. they, well, that's how they say it. Yeah, and they yeah. don't need dashes. But. Fiber optic cable delivered high speed internet. Yes, that's the term. Every premise. Okay. That's the, so. that's the that's the norm for that technology. I'm sending, I'm sending my version that Denise and I will be able to read. Maybe we put uh, quotes around fiber, uh, in front of fiber and... It's just hard to read that sentence, that's all. Let's look at what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hear my dogs barking? Yes. New norm is fiber optic cable. I see. That works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's a little easier to digest. All right. And so that would take the place of that other sentence. Is everybody good with that? Yep. Okay. Is somebody want to make a motion to approve the letter with this change? Someone I'll move that. John Brady. Is there a second? Second. All right, let's take a vote. Cliff? Aye. Darren? Aye. Rose? Aye. John? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, do we see um, David Sheets trying to dial in? Not yet. Oh. All right. Do you want him to do the call out system, Cliff? Sure. Um, as we're proceeding and nearly completing this phase of um, the restoration of the town hall, um, we're inching closer to that certificate of occupancy uh, and start using the hall again. Some time back, we had talked about the alarm system at the building, which is now installed and operational. If a fire occurred there today, um, what that alarm system would do is send out an audible alarm. And the hope is that somebody in the neighborhood would hear that and contact the fire department. It may be time for us to revisit um, looking at activating that system so that it would automatically call out um, to the fire department, uh, basically place a 911 call and uh, hopefully get a response a little bit quicker. We have made a, a significant investment and the town has made a significant investment and um, I think we would be remiss if we weren't making sure we did everything possible to protect it. So. If the select board um, is on board with this, I would like for us to pursue um, some quotes and find out what it would cost to activate that call out system. As I understand it, it's already built into the alarm system. It's just a matter of flipping the switch. And this is what Toby told us about too, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course. I don't think it has to get a quote. It doesn't cost anything to get a quote, right? Right. Exactly. Um, I've been told that an estimated cost would be around $60 a month, but I have nothing to verify that. So that's why I think we should get a formal quote. Yes, I agree. Do you want a motion for that? Um, I can make the motion. Okay. And consider it made. Is there a second? Okay. I'll, I'll second. second. I'll second that, and I'd like to have a discussion. Um, I think. I seem to recall, and I may be just imagining this, but I thought uh, if we, we had discussed that there, there's prospect of seeing a reduction in the cost of insurance on that building if we had such a system. 
that maybe you were going to look into it or you suggested we look into that as well? Yeah, that's uh, something I wondered about as well, that if we do have this, can we get a discount on our insurance? The other um, possibility is we want to look at is if we contracted with the same company that provides the alarm services at the garage, could we get a bulk discount? Yeah, that would be good to know. And also, who does it? Who does it call? It calls the fire department. I'm not sure if it's a direct call to the fire department or if it's uh, if it's a 9-11 uh, burst, and then the fire okay. department is contacted by the dispatcher. I'm not sure how that works. Right. So we don't have to like pick whether it's East Montpelier or Woodbury that gets contacted. It would go to dispatch Montpelier and Wood. Uh, I mean, East Montpelier and Woodbury are all dispatched out of Montpelier. It would go to dispatch. Yeah. Um, that would make sense. Yeah, it's the similar. The the school has it too, and the call goes out and it says, "Please respond to an automatic fire alarm activation at Callis Elementary School." So it's an automated thing. Goes right to the dispatch. Oh, okay. All right, well, that's good to know. Thanks for clarifying that. All right, are you ready to, is that an amend, a friendly amendment, John? No, it's not an amendment, it's just a discussion about how it would work. Okay. And the, and the motion is clear, Katie, in your notes, that all we're doing is looking, is investigating the cost and John's idea. That's not part of the motion. Never mind. Cost and options. All right. Uh, I'm not sure that's for fun bundling uh, contracts and stuff. Save money. Um, I'm sure Cliff will do a thorough investigation and this is just to get a quote as was said in the motion. Yeah. All right, are you ready to vote? like David's coming on board. Oh, good. Oh, there he is. You gotta, un he's gotta do audio. All right, so are you ready to vote on this? Okay, Cliff? Aye. Karen? Aye. Rose? Aye. John? Aye. And I'm an aye. So one other thing about this um, stuff at the town hall, because David looks like he's trying to get in. Come I had, in. I had a call from... Gotcha. If you can hear us, we can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, one, one thing before you get started, David. Sure. I had a call from Justin McC McCart. Is that the right name, Cliff? The guy with the yeah. Wi-Fi hotspot? That's correct. And, and apparently, I was going to try to put this in an email, but it was too much. Um, the Wi-Fi hotspot that we had thought was installed already at the town garage is not installed. He went to install it at the town garage, and the road crew um, was less than happy about having something like that at the garage, their concern, and it was a concern I had, but it was going to be short-lived, was that it would present, there might be some liability if people are driving around the town garage parking lot. And he said, Justin said, that he, after being there, realized that maybe it wasn't a good spot because of, you know, the huge sand pile and all the trucks and the graders going in and out. He agreed that it was maybe not the best location. Um, he said that we could put it at the town hall and then move it to wherever else we decided when we were ready. And we talked about having it in East Callis, maybe at the store at some point in the near future. So um, he said something about, and Cliff will have to explain this, something about one secure and one open. Do you know what that means, Cliff? Yeah, basically, it's, it works as a tandem system. You would have one connection that's password protected, and another that's for general use that doesn't require a specific password. So, would we get both, or is he talking about us pick one? Uh, I would have to have that discussion with him. It sounds to me like what he's talking about is this system is capable of providing two connections. Okay. Um, and then he said something about 
CVRS has the best new wireless technology, but I don't think that's what this is. Do you know what that means? Uh, it's probably a manufacturer of the device. I'm not sure. I know that um, it's money from Microsoft that's funding this, but I'm not sure whose equipment they're using. Yeah, he said something about Microsoft has, got, has, you know, kind of been trying to play the good guy and say they're going to do all this, but they're really not doing as much as they say. But regardless of that, um, he said that we could temporarily install it at the town hall. So I wanted to see what the board thought about doing that and then moving it at some point in the near future. Well, you know, that's got my vote. That's where I wanted it in the first place. So. And there was a reason that we weren't going to do that. And I can't remember now what that reason was. Initially, the reason we weren't going to do that is because there was a condition that required that there not already be a public Wi-Fi hotspot in, available for the site to be considered that it, it could not already have it. But it sounds like they're willing to waive that requirement for us. Or they just don't know. We'll have to make sure we turn it off and take it out. That, that's simple to do. Yeah. It is right. on the public map, though. Um, not a, it's an inaccurate map if it gets removed tomorrow. All right. So the system that is at the town hall is an antiquated system. It, it was installed prior to uh, the restoration beginning on the town hall, and it was just reactivated recently. So yeah. there is some concern about the stability and overall security right. of the system that's in place there. All right, so should we circle back around to Justin and agree to have it at the town hall? And then he said, after we get it at the town hall, we can do whatever we want with it. Yeah, I would support that. Yeah, me too. Okay, is that a, is that a motion and a second? So moved. John, is that a second? Sure. All right, any further discussion? Um, all right, hearing none, let's vote. Cliff? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Rose? Aye. John? Yes. And I'm an aye. Okay. So now I want to talk about the certificate of occupancy. One of the questions I was going to ask Alfred if he had made it to our meeting is apparently there's two small outdoor projects um, dealing with handicap parking accessibility and finishing up the um, outside work in front of the stairs that go to the second floor, you know, the ones by the road. Um, and John McCullough has been, was going to check with Alfred and see when the road crew could finish that up. Those are my understanding of the last two items that need to be completed before anybody comes to do um, a walkthrough for the certificate of occupancy. Um, and I know, you know, we've kind of said we're not going to use the town hall till there's a certificate. Um, if we don't find a place for our Thursday meeting, um, I'm waiting to hear from Maple Corner Community Club whether we can use that venue for Thursday's um, meeting with the union. And if that's if they say no, we're back to the town hall because we really don't have any other choice. But the good news is, is that really everything is done. The toilet paper towel holders are in, and toilet paper roll, anything in the kitchen is nothing that has to be completed to get the certificate of occupancy. The elevator is working. Um, all of those things that, re that labor and industry or fire safety would be looking at to give us that certificate is really done. And then David called um, called me a little while ago and asked about something that is being planned for the upstairs and that's around mid-June. So that's why I asked David to join us because he can explain it a lot better than I can. So what this is, is a local artist, uh, Hasso Ewing, who lives over in, on the west side of town um conceived of a project two months ago and has been working with a group of curators and 65 artists from 
throughout the state to create a project called Shelter in Place Project. And eventually the hope is that an exhibition will be mounted in a prominent location in Montpelier. The State House is one of them. City Hall is another. And the College of Fine Arts is the third probable venue. So at one of those three venues, we hope to mount this exhibition of 65 eight inch by eight inch shelters that artists are making throughout Vermont for the exhibition. Um, it's to be installed in a forest of red dogwood branches gathered from callus. And Paso needs a space to install the exhibition so that it can be appreciated for the month of June virtually, since we doubt that any of the prominent locations I just mentioned will be online yet until later in the summer. Um, it will then move to that location. But what she needs is just a hall where it could be put together and made available for an online presence. So there would be no audience, there would be no anything other than an empty space where this could be appreciated. Um, and the, her hope was to do it in the upstairs of the town hall. Um, with Nell Emlin, me, uh, Jeff Hewitt is part of this project. Um, it's quite a, a large group of us, Artie Tulis. Um, so a number of us are members as well of the friends of the town hall. So uh, Hasso actually started moving on this front because she thought that Artie and I had that kind of authority. And um, I told her to back off until... <laughs> until we had a chance to bring this to the real authorities, that would be you, uh, to simply give a green light or a red light, I guess, to uh, our ability to use the space for this purpose. Question. <laughs> it sounds like a really creative project, I gotta say. I don't know how people think of these things. Um, Cliff? Yes, Cliff. Uh, David, thanks for the overview. As you know, I have some background having attended other meetings where this was discussed. Right. Um, but hey, there's, hey, there's a fox in my, in, my, in my driveway. Well, if you had your camera on and you <laughs> turned it there, we could see it. <laughs> I got to go holler to Roger so he knows to watch the chickens. Okay. Uh, my question, David, is um, has John now been made fully aware of this and understand that well and that's what happened didn't happen without any conflict with what he's working on absolutely um what happened cliff since i haven't had a chance to talk to you about this um is that Artie um sounded out john and found that john had absolutely no problem at all but then he put hasso directly in touch with john and John invited her over to show her the ropes. And uh, eventually I heard that she was already in the hall and already beginning to plan <laughs> to plan to move in. So um, that's when I asked that they please slow down and wait until we got um, a little more authority involved um, here. So Perfect. that's where it's Thank at you. right now. John has absolutely no problem. Yes. All, of, all of his work is downstairs. Okay, great. Thanks. The kitchen. And so, I think Sharon has a question. I do. So what is what is the town's authority with regard to this certificate of occupancy? 
Do we do we establish the rules for the certificate? Do we decide whether to have a certificate of occupancy or not? Do we um, whether there is one or isn't? If there is one, is it our guidelines that govern it? No, I think it's the states. Yeah. It's all the states. And because of the because of the renovations, they have to come in and make sure the elevators work in that we got. Um, toilet paper holders that are ADA accessible, that kind of stuff. Right. So it's, and being, it's it's the sign off the the checklist sign off that's that um, approval for using the building that and indicating after finding that all all the uh, requirements have been met. So who decides that the requirements have been the, met? The state building inspector. So, so we don't decide whether to have to require a certificate of occupancy. We don't decide what the the criteria are for meeting the standards to to get the certificate, and we don't issue it. So right. some town right. zoning permits require certificate right. of occupancy at the end. That's what you're getting to. I don't think we require that for any. That's building. not us. That yes. Yeah. So I was wondering is this for this because this is a commercial type building okay. they're a state uh, there were renovations done and upgrades made done they need to make sure everything meets is to code and that's right. what I mean callous zoning regulations do not require the issuance by the zoning administrator of a certificate this is strictly state and what has happened because of covid they're backlogged right we weren't doing any in person inspections so um I was on the friends meeting last, I guess it was last week, and said that, you know, we could reach out to um, the state to see when they might be able to schedule this. Um, so that we, I mean, we really need to be able to start using it. We are very limited now on space. We've got the listers needing to use it for grievance hearings. We've got tax sales on June 24th. Um, it's very likely that we're going to need to use it this week. Is there any, in the alternative, is there is the state looking at um, awarding deputy status to somebody in the town to make the inspection? And what I was going to do was ask them if they would, since it's only going to be used for town type, mostly town type use, would they grant a waiver until they can come out and physically yeah. inspect it? Anything where my head is obviously probably is anything we can get in writing from the state that gives us the room to use it. That sounds great. But if we don't have that, I think absolutely not. So I'm willing to reach out to the fire safety department and see if it's labor and industry, um, labor and industry. It might be yeah, okay. Labor and industry. It's actually um, it's actually shifted, um, Rose, over to oh, the okay. It's now at the Department of Public Safety. Right. Okay. You're quite right. It used to be labor and industry, but now right. it's, it's public, public safety. safety. Yeah. So I want to. Um, I thought you know this is obviously something the board needs to weigh in on, um, and I'm willing to reach out and see what we can come up with, if everybody's in agreement for me to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm fine, but, but I want to, you know, all of my reservations, I want to be on the record. Yeah. All right. I will, I'm sure Katie's got them in the minutes and, you know, I, I also want to know if we do this, you know, is there any kind of a, um, a fine or any liability that the town might have? And I think I brought this up before because Sharon and I are mostly on the same page about this. So I'm ahead. confused. What the other suggestion was, I mean, on the list was the town garage, Maple Community Center. Yeah. And those two came up because of concerns raised about occupying a building prior to a, a certificate being issued. Why can't we have a town garage if we can't get the Maple Corner Community Center? I don't understand what the difficulty is. The this is doors open. It's warm out. It's, it's not just it's not just this, John. It's also the grievance hearings 
the June 24th tax sale. Right. But well, I see what you're saying. Okay, well, I thought we were trying. We're, we're we have an impending meeting in two days. Right. And and you know I I, I just don't. It's getting late here to. I well, we might, have, we might have to go to the town garage for our meeting this week, but the bigger issues are the other ones. The other ones coming up, the other meetings, the other um, things that it needs to be used for, so that people can social distance. That's right. that's the main push right now. Yeah. But Denise, your question of whether there's a penalty if we do, I think we're not we're not we're not talking about doing. We're talking about finding out when, what the state's timeline is. I would ask them if they can deputize somebody else. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a regulatory agency. They can't do that. That would be like, uh, you know, A&R deputizing you to issue a uh, air pollution control permit, Sharon. I don't think they can do that. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know what authority or flexibility they have in these times. And well, that's... That's what we're investigating. Right. That's what we're trying to find out. What flexibility is there? Mm -hmm. So think, it sounds... Go ahead, I David. I think there is something to the COVID-19 emergency um, and your needs um, and the fact that the state has a backlog. All of these things, I would hope that the department would be working with you. Um, and so I do think it, it, it would help for Denise to make an appeal to them right? In, under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But Denise, you want something in writing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I want some, I'm, so I'm gonna send them an email um, and I want it in writing. Yep. Yeah. And I guess, you know, Hasso's gonna have to wait. Mm -hmm. So if you can, unfortunately, okay. it sounds like a great project. I support the project. Sure. But until we get this figured out, I don't, she cannot, be up there doing stuff and if you could relay our regrets to okay. her um and hopefully she'll she, she should understand she works at the hospital yeah. so she knows what's been going on sure okay all right anything else for david thank you david thank, thank you david you. thank you keep up the good work david, david. And I think Linda Linda also had me on the phone about, um, <clears throat> so if we're done with um, town hall, if we could skip, and I didn't know that this was going to be something somebody wanted to weigh in on, but there's been some issues with Curtis Pond swimming access. So if everybody would be in agreement to jump to that, is that all right? Yeah, okay. I'll, be, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Go ahead without me. So um, I had been in contact with Daniel Kearney or Keeney, or I can't remember how you say his last name. He's the new person in charge of the swim program. And I, I think I remember updating everybody last meeting that we weren't sure if the swim program was going to go forward for two, for two reasons, because of COVID-19 and because they were having difficulty locating an instructor. It sounds like the main concern right now is the instructor. But I have had um, some input from the locals, and rightly so, that the swim access area has been extremely crowded and will probably continue to be a real hot spot um, this summer as people decide to stay home and stay local. So, you know, these we've had some nice days. People are in the water. Um, the governor's directive was, you know, go and have some fun and then leave so somebody else had to take a turn. And we don't really have anybody or any good way to enforce any of that. So um, Linda um, called and sent me an email, which I sent to Katie <clears throat> to put in the folder with her idea. So Linda, you want to have a chance to speak? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I, <coughs> I love Curtis Pond like I am a little bit worried about the entrance of both the going down the steps and also going over to the grassy meadows because yeah, people in the <coughs> past have been able just to 
plop themselves down in both those entrance places with their towels or their kids or their chairs, and then they stay. And then you say, excuse me, and you, you go into the pond however you can. Well, that's not going to be working that much. So it's the entrances that I'm to the water itself that I'm kind of worried about. How do people get into it? And how do people know that they need to make way? And also, um, in Curtis, going down to the step area, do you all you know what it looks like, the access, the swim area? Okay. So there's a path that goes down from the parking, but there's another path that goes around that there could be a going in and there could be a coming out, too. I mean, if we did that, so there are ways to try to help manage Curtis better. And I'd be willing to, I'm not going to do it solely, but I'd be willing to work with some people on creating, and if we could have some signages, you know, just saying, like, you know, you can't stay in this area, you can have your chairs back here, you know, not all that, not wordy, but just figure out how to say it, you know, you know, and, you know, whatever the wordage is going to be, that people know that, and then make sure that it gets out on front porch forum, um, the bridge, because you're going to have people from Montpelier coming. I mean, people are not going to Maine. They're not going on their vacations. They're here. And Curtis is a spot. Yeah. And you don't want to take it away from them, but we got to manage it better. The teenagers, they come and they think that the raft is all theirs. And so... There's a lot of different ways how to keep it so we can all love it and how can it be managed better. And I know, Katie, you've got some feelings about it. Do you want to say that? Go ahead, Katie. May I make a public comment? Yes. Yeah, um, we, we've been going every day because the black flies are so bad that my kids like are not outside moving. So we've gone every day for the last week except for the weekend because it was insanely packed. And it's, it's stressful because the people that are showing up um, – haven't thought it through. So sometimes you get there and it's totally fine where you get to the boat launch and different households are taking turns and making room for each other and you're just getting in and then leaving. Other times we were there one day and there was a group of nine teenagers who were behaving lovely, of course, but clearly no one had talked with them about what they should do when they get there to talk with other people. So as I tried to talk with them about what is your plan, they had brought food and donuts and we're having a nice party, but we couldn't stay with nine large people in that tiny, tiny spot. They weren't there to swim. They were just hanging out. And so I, I would appreciate there being a way that we could um, understand what the expectations are so that when we're there, I, I would like to know what to expect and also to be able to have an easier time talking with other people around. This is kind of what the town decided. And um, so, so that the expectation is out there of how we're going to use the space. And, but, and, and number 10, Tom, you know, she put on... Um, Mary Jacobs put on a whole thing of really strong expectations. If there's no parking, you leave. Um, so they're going to come to Curtis, <laughs> you know, because the ponds are not working together. It's like, this is my way. Is it, I mean, so, I mean, this is all callous, you know, and, and so it's sort of like, how can we help Curtis be a good spot for people? I mean, right, and, rem and remember that the number 10 pond access is not – um, town owned Curtis, Curtis Pond is um, somebody suggested I think it was Jamie Morby suggested maybe putting up you know, parking signs on one side of the road to limit the number of people that can park and go there but that doesn't help with the people that park and maybe in the place where it's designated and then don't leave so Linda offered to put together herself um and a few other people that maybe, came up maybe with. Maybe you join me. Um, <laughs> maybe a few other people. You know, Burlington is putting up some signs. You know, maybe we could get some ideas from them, post some signs. But again, you know, we don't have the resources for someone to patrol the swimming area and and say, you know, this is kind of what the state is saying you should do. So we kind of got to figure out what we can do and how we're going to do it. And Linda is willing to work on that and get back to us. And Katie just said she would work with me. So if I one other person, maybe, would you do that, Sharon? No. 
Well, <laughs> maybe Jamie, maybe we could get Jamie or some, some one other person. Right. We could research and I think get it in the beginning and we're not going to monitor it. But I mean, if we if we could, could make some statements in the beginning, it could be more helpful. I do. And, and there could be something posted. Jerry. Where is the where is the Curtis Pond Association that formed a year or two ago? Yeah. Is, is there one? Yeah, there is one. Mm -hmm. um, but that they did that mainly, I think, because of the dam. Sure. And but, then don't and then don't forget. And I just happened to think of this. We could, um, you know, the town has that reservation thing for use of the island. Given the circumstances. It might be this year we don't authorize folks to use the island um, because of the COVID-19. I think you're right that they formed because of the, the dam, but they did form. I don't remember what their bylaws are, what their mission and all that stuff, but there is an association and it seems like it would be, it would be good for us to um, invite invite their leadership on a Curtis Pond issue. Um, it was, is Heidi Thompson a part of that? Yes. Because I saw Heidi, Katie and I were there and Heidi came and, um, and she was basically saying, I'm too busy for anything. If you want to be a part of the Pond Association, you can Linda, <laughs> you know, that's what she said. She wasn't interested at all. Well, and, and don't forget the Curtis Pond swim area is owned by the town. So, you know, while the Pond Association, you know, as you said, Sharon, could be helpful, I don't think they're going to do it. I think this is a town issue. And if Linda and a few others are willing to come up with some ideas. We could check back with them, though, Sharon. Right. We yeah, could you could check with them. But, yeah, but if, if we're back. going into July, by the time we get the signage, it's not going to work. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the select board. board. What? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm done. Maybe the select board, at least in the interim during this situation, could impose a residency standard, residents and their guests standard on the Curtis Pond swimming area. One of the greater problems there, and it's been a perennial problem, and I've brought this up over the last decade and a half I've been on the select board, is that you know I've been pushing for a residency requirement there for years. And I know I, Davis Charrington pushed back against that somewhat. Yeah, I remember that. His family was a family that donated the land to the town. And I did ask Davis, were there conditions on the, on the donation? He said, no, you could do it. I just would rather not see that. Um, but, you know, when we weren't talking about COVID-19 15 years ago, I don't, right. uh, so I, I would suggest maybe we revisit that. And maybe if the select board's in agreement, we put a sign up. It's it's basically the standard we put in place for the island. Uh, and I pushed for, and I'm pretty sure that's in the permit, that permits can only be issued to residents and their guests. Um, and we might want to just do that. Now, who's going to police it? Right. But the residents could police it. They could say, are you a resident? No. Are you here with a resident? No. See ya. Because comes the formal summer season, it's basically in it. Um, half of Montpelier either hits uh, number 10 or Curtis Pond, and it's going to go from bad to worse. We had a sign up there that might, do, you know, a couple signs right there on the road, parking for residents this side of the road only, and their guests. Use of this area by residents and their guests only. If you are not a resident or accompanied by a resident, please do not use this. This is off limits. I really have to do that. We can always pop the signs, you know, if things lighten up. Um, or we might just think that's a, a good policy. I, I just think we're taking something away from people that is really important. Well, you can't, Linda, if there's no space, if there's no space and you're going to have half a month till you come. Not really. Well, we do. Maybe the, we'll we've had parking issues. Both we have a parking outside the road. I believe it's signed no parking because of every were, well, every year we have a parking. 
we've been dealing with this for the old time I've been on the select board. Yeah, me too. Well, what do you say that um, we, oh, Katie? I'm just curious if there's guidelines from the state. I called Wrightsville today and it's pretty intense. They're completely closed until they're meeting what they describe as their, what the state has set out for guidelines for them. They're gonna be painting square a square grid on the sand every day. And if you get there and the grid is taken up, you're welcome to wait in the parking lot and walk down to swim, but you can't sit or be anywhere on the beach. They've removed all the picnic tables. They're not gonna allow, um, and they've installed like foot pumps for the hand washing station. It, it sounded intense. I was wondering if it's the same sort of requirements for a town, town swim area or maybe it's different. I did send an email to um, 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 who, who would I send? Who did I send it to earlier today? Um, when I, after I talked to Linda, asking what the state guidelines are mm -hmm. for opening this swim area. You know, I said it, you know, it's a local swim area it's owned by the town. There's swim lessons there. So hopefully somebody from the state will get back to me. And that may take, they may have guidelines that we're not aware of. I've searched mm -hmm. and searched and read all kinds of stuff and can't find anything specific to, to this kind of situation. John? Well, to underscore, this is a town property. It's mm. use of town residents. That was the original intent. Um, the town insures it. If somebody, some family goes up there, not from town, and their children, God forbid, get infected by someone else, not from town, we could be sued for not practicing, employing best practices. In fact, we've just have, now had a conversation that's a public record with the press visiting in on it. And if we just ignore this and the concerns that our residents have raised now, um, I think we imperil the town if there's another outbreak and one can, or someone intent, uh, attempts to point the finger as uh, the, Cal the Curtis Pond swim area is, as being the place where a family member has gotten infected. And uh, as uh, Katie said, uh, the state has employed standards, rigorous standards. Others around the state and country have employed rigorous standards for all kinds of areas. And for us to just not do anything uh, in light of all these concerns, in light of all these uh, more highly regulated uh, approaches, um, I think we're we're asking for it. And I don't know what the league would think or league's insurance carrier would think about us leaving this open to the general public. The idea of having it just open to residents is you now shrink the pool of possible people. It could still get crowded. There still should be other measures, but to say it's open to all of central Vermont as it traditionally has been is I think dangerous. It's not a big place like Wrightsville. What about um, running this through Jim Barlow? What's he gonna say? He's gonna say you got liability. Talk to the insurance. I think we call the insurance company, we call the league and ask them what they would like us to do. Mm -hmm. I can do that. We obviously, need some more, we obviously need some more guidance on this because some places I guess it's something I read there. There's restaurants are required to take reservations and keep a, a log of who comes to their restaurants. I don't know what Burlington is doing with their beaches, how they're managing it. Um, if they're doing anything like that, but they have a lot more people to help manage a situation and do some kind of patrol to see what's going on. Right. You know, well, that's, that's, John, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, but I do, I, I'm concerned, maybe this is what you're saying, Denise. If, if we say callous residents only, then we have, then it's going to, we're going to be hearing from people that we're not policing that. And, and I'm not saying that that's a bad, I, that it's a, that's, that's not the way to go. I'm just, I don't, there's not a great answer no matter which direction you turn. So I think this, this, this is going to require some more investigation and thought. Yeah, I, and I don't know, I mean, how I feel about being 
of, I understand, John, what you've said, but to be a part of the exclusiveness is just, that doesn't feel good to me. So I don't know. That's not what you would sign up for. <laughs> That's what I'm not signing up for. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're right. But I would sign up um, if you came up with something and if Katie and some other people, but I don't know if I would say for town only. I would just, let's just. Maybe that's why rights will close because it could be. I, mean, I think I just would have to think about it. Katie, could you tell? Can do you know? Could you send me the name and phone number of whoever you talk to over there? Sure. Yeah, I just pulled it off their website. I know that they are. They're setting up a whole online ticket buying thing to avoid that contact, and so that I, it sounds like so that they know who's going to be there. Right. I'm on the Burlington uh, Parks Recreation Waterfront website. Beaches are closed. Wow. That's it. Due to COVID-19 outbreak. I mean, that's the easiest option, but that doesn't help with people like Linda or Katie who want to go there. And then, you know, if we close it, then that means there can be no swim lines. Right. So I was trying to find a way to get the numbers down right. to reduce the risk. I was suggesting during this crisis that we limit it to residents. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm done typing in. I ain't going there. Uh, that's my suggestion. We can't have half of Central Vermont come here and close, you know, let, line up like they're going to Costco and then say we're concerned and not want to keep them out. You got to pick, you got to pick your poison, folks. This is not about exclusivity, Linda. It's about protecting everybody from getting sick. Um, in a way that we can handle. Like, that was just the me reaction that I had. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I do. Yeah. Katie? My, my final comment is that I felt really weird about going to, my kids want to go to the places that we've loved in the past in Middlesex and Montpelier to jump in the river even for 20 minutes. And I feel odd about it. Like we go, other parents with small kids see us and then they leave. And it, it feels odd to leave our community to go somewhere else to get that. So from my perspective, I don't I don't have an opinion one way or the other about telling people they can't come, but it makes sense to me that we have a spot that's right in our in our community, and I would be respectful to the people who Curtis Pond is their backyard, so that they're getting their needs met, um, able to be safe and boating in there. They don't have a yard; they've got these little waterfront properties. So, from my perspective, having a way that I can stay local and not be imposing on other people's communities is important to me too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like this is going to take some further thought. So let's put this back on the agenda for June 8th and do some investigation in between. And who's doing that investigation? Is that now on you only, Denise or Linda? Are you still are you still in or not in? I will I'll do something. <laughs> I'm just I'm digesting it all because what I, what I said I would do is contact the right to bill place and hopefully get somebody from the state to respond to the email I sent. And to John, I'll contact the league and find out about what the insurance carriers are expecting. Of us. Okay, that would be really helpful. And then we'll have then we have something to work with. So this is just kind of opening the door here to, um, you know, how to deal with the situation. And it's just it's going to get worse before it gets better as far as people coming to the pond mm -hmm. and that's right yeah. yep. there's yeah. a uh, there's a little pictorial on the burlington enjoy burlington.com code slash forward slash covid19 website and it says come to the parks to play for a while but please limit your time here and move on yeah, so other than that space without creating unnecessary crowding. That's we could also have a policy that says you can use it for 20 minutes and you're out of there. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> right. that, and again, that would be really hard to enforce. Yeah, right. I don't I don't think enforce. This is going to be an honor system. Right. And then, and then if we do something like that, just know that then we're going to get calls from people saying that, well, so-and-so was there for 30 minutes instead of 20 and what are you going to do about it? And that's going to, there's not going to be anybody to do anything about it. Well, then that's what happens. I mean, the governor issued edicts and the press said just that. And who's going to enforce it? And the governor said, 
and has said repeatedly, it's an honor system. Yeah, and of yeah. course, we went to the stores, and some stores are pretty rigid, like Abishan. And then there was tractor supply, and people were coming without masks and purposefully coming in your space and laughing, you know. And that's just the way it is. So, um, but we, we, we can't not do anything. We've got to try. Right. Well, and I think, so I think this has been good. I think we have a plan to check things out, see what we might be able to do. And, and, the, and, and so, I'm so, John, if you had, I mean, I was just thinking from my little person who goes there, not as the government of Palace, you know, and if, it, if we're not going to have the, I would have rather have the pond for residents than not at all. Yeah. So, when it gets okay. to the all right, so we'll we'll put this back on the agenda for the eighth. Thank you, Linda. Bye. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Katie, for that. See ya. Bye. Take care. Um, can I ask a question? Is there? It's we're almost at nine o'clock. My, I am turning into a pumpkin. Yeah, I think we're almost done, Sharon. Uh, I'm already a pumpkin. Yeah, but you don't have to drive home. <laughs> so the only other thing. Um, no driving while well pumpkinated. Exactly. Oh, I want some of that. So we know that, you know, when the server's being installed at the town office, it's this Friday. Um, we talked have, about the Wi-Fi already. Don't, you know, and we have a little bit of a scheduling conflict. If you see my notes, um, we have scheduled the 28th, the 4th, and the 11th, if we need it, um, with the union. And we also, on the 11th, have our quarterly meeting with the East Montpelier Select Board and the Fire Department. Maybe we won't need it for the other, but if we do, we're going to have to be done by, like, 6. I think we're going to do one or the other. Man, I think we got. I think the East Montpelier meeting is going to be important. The end of the fiscal year. Yeah. No, that's not where my head went. My head went to if we had is if we let them know now um, that the eleventh actually, you know, are bad. We shouldn't have offered you that date. Well, we're, if we're meeting at four, we can meet for two hours. And then do and then do and the East Montpelier. So anyways, I just want to put that on everybody's radar. We're not, um, though, we're not though, Denise. They wanted five. Five meetings? No, no, no. 5 p.m. Oh, right. Right. 5 p.m. Maybe they won't need that for the other meetings. But we can talk about it with them on Thursday and let them know about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to put it out there that I'm not available at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock on any of those dates. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I said that last meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Rose. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I'd like to do is approve the minutes. Denise. What? Um, I, I attend uh, meetings of legislative committees via Zoom. Yeah. What I find most frustrating is I, I can only attend via YouTube, and there are only certain select people that get invited, which I find frustrating. Uh, but we have the press here. We have Dave Delcor on and Orca Media. And what I find frustrating is I'm not able to ask questions or get clarifications as a observing citizen uh, at legislative committee meetings. I, I would just like the chair to ask uh, either uh, Orca's rep or David Delcor and or David Delcor if they have any questions of us um, or if they need anything clarified. While we yeah, have I assume on. that they would weigh in if they had a question. We're happy to answer any questions uh, that well, you may have. Okay. If you have a question, let us know. You can either type or you can take yourself off mute and ask a question. Thank you. We want to be open and transparent. So can we, I'd like to do the minutes. There's only three. Um, and then I'd like to go into per, um, executive session to talk about a personnel matter for like maybe 10 minutes. 
All right. So let's do the minutes. Um, March 14th, that was that meeting we had on a Saturday. Has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes? Okay. I do not remember that meeting. <laughs> that was when COVID hit. Oh, that one. Uh, yes, I do remember that. And I read those minutes and I made a few changes. Yeah, I think I made a couple of small changes on those minutes and the other two as well, but there was nothing really significant. Katie always does a really good job. I made non-substantive changes to make it easier to read. So with that, is that a, I would make a motion to approve the 314 minutes um, with changes as noted. I think Sharon and I probably are the only ones that made any notes. Cliff, did you? I did not, but I checked them again today uh, before the meeting and I'm okay with the suggested changes. I would move to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Rose, did you have anything? Nope. John? I was not in attendance. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll vote to support him. But, um... All right, so let's take a vote. Cliff? Aye. John? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Rose? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, um, the May 4th minutes. That was a special meeting. I think I made a few changes in there. Can you see them, Katie? Everybody have a chance to look at those. I saw your you you made a looks good note. I made a few. Oh, this is actually something we should talk about on the May fourth. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go in and call them up. I can't see them. Um, I'm going to talk while you do that. So, Cliff, do you remember we talked about the RFP that night and? I didn't go look at other minutes to see when this conversation happened, but at some point, at some meeting, we clarified that the RFP, we want to make sure that the, that the RFP is clear that the town retains the flexibility to not award a painting contract. But I don't remember if this was the fourth or some other time. But and what was weird about this one is we had this whole conversation, but we didn't vote on it. So, no, because no, because Cliff was going to make some changes to the RFP. Mm -hmm. um, I think we voted. We might have voted on it the next time, on the eleventh. Um, okay. Well, yeah, I forget yeah. which meeting it was, but I did go back um, and go through the minutes to make sure that we had approved it before I sent it out. So if if we don't care, then let's just leave my note in here on this one that we. So we have it really clearly documented that we decided not to, that we decided that, you know what I'm saying, that we, that we made it, we discussed and made a decision to add to definitely the RFP. We did. We definitely did. I yeah. just want to make sure it's somewhere. So now it's here, and maybe that's not exactly the right place, but at least it's somewhere. Okay. Well, okay that's so, fine, um, and it was added to the contract, or to the RFP. I know it was. Just want to make sure that we, that, because that's kind of a big deal. That was the most stuff. I also took out the town of Barry and was silent on where I don't, I'm not sure it was even Barry Town. In any place, not all towns offered um, remote access to records. So I left that part in. Those yeah. are my changes. All right. So is there, is that your motion to approve with changes, Sharon? That was my motion to approve with changes. I'll second that. All right. Um, any further discussion? All, uh, Cliff? Aye. Okay, John? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Rose? You have to take yourself off mute. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, let's do the um, May 11th minute. Everybody had a chance to review those? <clears throat> I think I made some comments and on these. 
I made some changes that we may need to have Alfred and Toby look at to get clear on like whether that class <coughs> two grant covers or are we applying for a grant to do it? Like it wasn't clear to me. Do we have the grant? Are we applying for the grant? Okay, we, we can do these the next time then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I had an, uh, some questions on the, um, yeah, what's her, the woman that was on the call that night, Katie, Kate Phillips. She hasn't been appointed yet to the Historic Preservation Commission. She would like to be, but she isn't yet. So, okay, so let's just hold those until um, we meet on the 8th. Katie, would you mind asking Alfred and Toby to read that paragraph in my edits and see if that's accurate? Or maybe you remember. But we're not going to remember. Somebody's going to have to ask them. I can do it, too. I'm happy to email it to him. The way I wrote it was as clear as I understood it while he was talking. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that, too. Yeah, okay. it's, I'll em should I email it to Alfred? I think it was Toby who was talking about the grants. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to go into executive session. Like I said, it's like 10 minutes if we can do that. I would make a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel matters per 1 VSA section 313A3. At 9.04 p.m. And I'll support that motion with a second as long as it's as short-lived as possible. Yeah. I'm here. Sharon needs to go home. She's looking like a pumpkin. Yeah. Well, well, how come she's wearing, but she's wearing green, not orange. Pumpkins have green stems. Oh, okay. I'm a raw pumpkin. Bye, Katie. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye, Thank Katie. you. Did we, vote, reaction? did we vote to go into executive session? No, yeah. yeah. No. Cliff? Cliff? Hi. Cliff. You got to take yourself off mute, Cliff. Yeah, it wasn't letting me do that. I say okay. aye. All right, Sharon? Aye. Rose? Aye. And I'm an aye. Good. Do you expect any action? No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, David. You too. Good night, Orca.